does the public want? What does the public want in music? Tell me tonight. What do you want in music? What do you like in music? America's town meeting of the year gives its salute tonight to old New England, which gave us Thanksgiving Day, and the American town meeting itself. We are assembled here in historic town hall in New York City for a novel discussion, a town meeting on the subject, What Does the Public Want in Music? Now, what could be more appropriate than to imagine ourselves transported to the library of a famous and widely loved New England character, Professor William Lyon Phelps, Billy Phelps, as he is affectionately called by his students and friends. So let us use our imagination tonight and picture ourselves in Professor Phelps' library in New Haven where he has entertained celebrities from all over the world. Tonight, his guests are Madame Olga samarov Tchaikovsky, critic and teacher, and founder of the Layman's Music Courses, Dr. Frank Black, general music director of the National Broadcasting Company, Mr. Albert Sesso, American composer and conductor, Mr. Fred Waring, director of his own orchestra, the famous Waring Pennsylvanian, Mr. I.A. Hirschman, among many other accomplishments, the founder and director of the New Friends of Music, Miss Pauline Pierce, our soloist for the evening. And to complete the company, our own moderator and director, Mr. George B. Denny, Jr. Now, what does the public want in music? Professor Phelps and his guests will discuss this for the first part of the hour. And then, following our usual custom, we will have questions from the audience of music lovers and musicians who have assembled here tonight to participate in this meeting. Now, Dr. Black is at the piano. He is about to play the accompaniment for Miss Pierce, who will sing a popular aria from Carmen, the Habanera. Of course, the star system in music wouldn't work in chamber concerts. 
about the in Grand Opera? How about it? Fred Waring? Well, now, Fred is a man who has reached not only thousands, but millions. And he probably knows as much about it as anyone now appearing before the public. Then my good friend, Alga Samaro, I'll give a section of her biography when I introduce her. But you know already she succeeded. She succeeded already as pianist, as teacher, as composer, critic, and founder of the Lehman's Music Board. And no meeting in town hall would be complete without my friend George Denny, who has the patience of Joe and the energy of Napoleon. He has the energy of Napoleon because he's put through this town meeting, and he has the patience of Joe because he's heard me lecture many, many times. Now, I think, first of all, you'd like to hear from my friend Frank Black. As you all know, he is the director of music over the air. And uh, I take the greatest pleasure in calling upon Frank Black now to start this discussion for us tonight. Professor Phelps, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, other speakers to come. I speak from the standpoint of radio because I'm in radio. By radio, I mean the National Broadcasting Company and what other programs I hear over other networks, which I'm able to hear. Radio is going ahead on the assumption that the general public has good taste. We know that there is a vast portion of people uh, constantly growing in the United States who are listeners to purely symphonic programs. That is the reason that weekly we present orchestras such as the Boston Symphony, the Cleveland Symphony, the Rochester Philharmonic, and the Rochester uh, Civic Orchestra. Most of this music comes from uh, public concerts where there's a paid audience. We also know that there's a great audience for popular music, and when I say popular music, I I don't mean five-piece so-called jazz bands. I mean organizations such as Paul Whiteman, Fred Waring, Rudy Valley, uh, and not alone this type of organization, but others who play exclusively for dancing. The, the music for these organizations is orchestrated, uh, well, it's orchestrated as carefully, sometimes better than uh, some symphonic conductors that I know. We also broadcast opera from the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, from San Francisco, from Chicago, and by shortwave from the finest opera houses in Europe. We present a great deal of so-called classical music, semi-classical music. That is the pieces in short forms and, and uh, the salon type of numbers. These by serious composers. We perhaps do not broadcast as many modern works as the musical snob or sophisticate would like us to broadcast. You know that even 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the New World Symphony was old-fashioned music for the snob. Uh, but the general public doesn't think so, because if they did, they'd stay away from the concert halls when that symphony is being played. And uh, I don't think that the musical snob has the least idea of what the people want, what the public want. So I think we can disregard the sophisticate in music. Regardless of the amount of mail we receive saying, why so much of that horrible jazz, I find that the amount of popular music broadcast is about the same percentage as that which the general public hears outside of radio. In other words, the majority of concert goers uh, attend one concert weekly, perhaps two. And aside from that, they hear mostly popular music in hotels, in public dining rooms, theaters, nightclubs, and in their own homes. Uh, last season, music comprised uh, between, 50, uh, between 65 and 66 percent 
of the total time on our network. Of this 65%, assuming that that's now 100%, OPERA provided us with about 3% of that total. Classic music occupied a fifth of the total. Uh, the uh, dance music occupied a little more than one quarter of the total. The balance was either the so-called semi-classic or light type of music, such as comic opera selections, art songs, and so forth. In other words, not popular songs and not symphony or opera repertoire. There are just as many bad performers, performances of works in the classic repertoire as there are in those of the popular field. I personally would have rather hear a good performance vocally of Old Man River than a bad one of Earl Caney. And I think the public would, too. We are long past the time when people should sit in respectful silence and listen to a mediocre performance of any of the well-known classics. In the first place, the public is beginning to know when the performances are bad. The radio certainly has pointed the way to the concert hall and a great many things. For a vocalist, it has put great stress on diction, or more properly, enunciation. People no longer want to go to a concert hall and hear a fine voice only. They want to hear a word because they have been, become accustomed to hearing the words of a song over the air. Therefore, if a singer's diction is poor, his life in the concert hall will be short. This is true of popular singers as well as leader singers. Radio has acquainted the public with the best and serious music, and unless they are reasonably sure of hearing good performances of works, they stay away from the concert hall. Mail is one of our most potent indications of public taste and its wishes in the matter of programming. However, it is not the only way of finding out what the public listens to. There are such things as surveys made by telephone and house-to-house -house canvassing, which are also good cross-sections on the subject. I do not agree with a group of musicians who claim that radio should be like a doctor who feeds his patients only what he thinks is good for them. It's too easy for them to turn the dial. I also think that the person who writes a letter saying, why all this jazz, or another who writes, why must we have to listen to that, or this modern music, that these persons do not consult their radio schedules and their newspapers. After all, if there's something going on in which you're not interested, there are probably millions of others who are enjoying it, and you should tune in at a time when you can hear what you want. Thank you. It's very delightful to me to sit here on this platform, right in the corner of my library, with all of these uh, very distinguished musicians. Nobody in the world loves music so much as I do, and everybody in the world can play music better than I can. There's only one instrument in the world that I play, and that's the typewriter. But you know, I remember what Oscar Wilde said about that. He said, I hate the typewriter, but he said the typewriter, when played with expression, is better than the piano played by members of the family. <laughs> the first thing I do when I get to heaven, I'm going to learn to play the piano. And I invite you all, all the people that are now in my library, and all the invisible audience listening in, I invite you all, one million years from tonight, the million Thanksgiving we have in heaven, hear me play the piano with an accompaniment of 1,000 harps. <laughs> now I'm going to call on my dear friend, Miss I. Hirschman, because he is a miracle man. He is the most austere form of music known to the world, Farthest removed from the lowest order, the music that appeals to the highest order of real highbrow is, of course, chamber music. And this wonderful man has made chamber music popular in talking about other things and that. Uh, just tell us how you did that, Mr. Kershaw. We'd love to. <laughs> Professor Phelps, ladies and gentlemen. It is a favorite pastime to underestimate the taste of the public. This has been happening in America in the last several decades. Artists who tour the country, who dare to offer good programs of so-called classics, report the undying gratitude of audiences whose capacity for good music has not been discounted. 
reminds me of a statement of a friend of mine who said that a classic is something written by a man with whiskers. People will listen to all kinds of music, but they will prefer the best. This is invariable. Yet why is so much mediocre, saccharine music poured into the ears of the innocent American public? The Society of Composers keeps full figures on the ra relation of radio to Tin Pan Alley, and the statisticians reveal cold figures. They figured out that in 1934, some 85 songs were each played more than 10,000 times on the air. When the adding machine had finished clicking over these 85 items, it was found that in addition to using 16% of the time given to music in the air, they had a grand total of 1,255,669 performances. This was for uh, 85 songs. The fault lies, it seems to me, with the artists as well as the public and those who are the promoters of music. Who, if not, is the art of who, if not the artist, is to set the standard of what is good and what is mediocre for the public to have. And to you, the public, if you want better music, you should write in and say so. Now, frankly, how many of you take the trouble to do it? The days of the musical patron are over. We tried an experiment with a pure form of music, chamber music, not austere, as Professor Phelps said. It's it, uh, for everyone, and all you have to do is listen to it without. Uh, any uh, preconceptions or fear, and you'll find that a whole new world will open up to you. We tried this with low prices and have sold out by subscription 16 countries completely in advance. Is this proof of a taste of the American people? People will support the best music and the best artists. I don't mean artists who resort to pyrotechnics and fireworks for results, procure the way of going up and coming down even more quickly and then disappearing. There are some great young American artists who deserve your support, and will get their chance at least in the new friends of music. All good things do not come from Europe either. Art flourishes in a sympathetic environment, and is not limited ge to geography any more than trees and flowers are, and music derives from the same source. The radio is helping give music back to the people to whom it belongs. No longer will it be handed out by rich patrons as a so-called musical dole. A new, younger audience is developing, pleading for more direct, uh, a simple approach to our art. America is the hope of a restless civilization. We know that our art, that all art, outlasts all forms of human endeavor. And only from the art have we been able to reconstruct the past and to set a pattern for the higher life for the future. I believe that I voice the yearnings of thousands when I say that America and especially young America, wants at least to be exposed to the better things of life, to better opera, the symphony concerts with the accent only on the music, and the very best in chamber music and all music at low prices within the reach of all. And I believe they'll get it eventually. If there's any snobbery in music, any of the so-called sophisticates, it derives not from the exclusive few, but from those who insist that they know the taste of the millions of the people, and arbitrarily set standards for them on the basis of a mediocre musical diet. Uh, a dictionary says that a snob is one who makes birth or wealth or superior position the sole criterion of worth. Is it not possible that people who hand out inferior, inferior music indulge in a form of even more dangerous snobbery? Uh, isn't it an assumption and an... Uh, uh, arbitrarily uh, an assumption to preclude the opinion of others who are so who are so called uh, sophisticated uh, at least i believe that people deserve the opportunity to decide what they want for themselves i think they should be given all kinds of music uh given the best without fear along with other kinds and let them decide and then there will be no question as to what constitutes the standard of music in, in America. Uh, uh, this meeting attests to that purpose, and it is a tribute to the League for Political Education and the NBC that they have made it possible to crystallize such a discussion. Thank you.
You're a, you're a brave man, Mr. Hirschman. I wish you were on the Yale faculty with me. <laughs> For the job of a teacher, of course, is not to give people what they want, but to give them what he thinks they need, which is a very different thing. You know, I'm exactly the right person to uh, preside tonight. Uh, because we're going to discuss everything from chamber music to jazz, and I'm exactly the right person because I love the most, the highest and the most splendid forms of music, and I love a brass band and a pipe and drum corps and almost anything. I'm very proud of the great scholars on the Yale faculty, and I'm very proud of one of my pupils, Rudy Valet. And I'll tell you why, because he has reached Millions and millions of people by his own genius and by incredible energy and work. Not only that, not only that. The man who's going to speak to us now, Fred Waring, stands uh, in very much the same position, having audiences of millions that he entertains with delightful forms of music. And did you know, he is the great-grandson of the founder of Penn State College, so that four generations of scholarships, somewhat diluted, are now <laughs> are now in his veins. And I'm so glad to introduce these people, because all the highbrows think I'm a lowbrow, and all the lowbrows think I'm a highbrow. <laughs> Now, come on, Fred, and the tremendous curiosity to see you. So many people have heard this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, first of all, let me thank you, Billy Phelps, for the very kind imaginary invitation to your imaginary library. And thank you for that generous portion of imaginary Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> and uh, let me first remind you, before I get into any kind of a discussion, that I am primarily not a speaker, and I didn't bring my banjo. I'm supposed to be a leader of an orchestra, and uh, that could even be questioned. However, I am here to take part in a discussion, what does the public want in music? And I shall do my very best to tell you not what the public wants, but what I think the public wants of us. Uh, because I don't think I would dare go much further than that. Uh, it has been my experience, uh, 18 years of experience in music, professionally, has been my experience not to tamper very much with the public's wants, but to uh, experiment and find out what they have liked that you have given them and continue to give them what they like rather than to try to educate them. Professional musicians, I believe, are in a very, very dangerous position. They attempt to educate the public. The education should come the primary grade and their early schooling, then if they learn to like any particular style or type of music, well, that's what they're going to listen to. But as I say in our, in our own department, we attempt to give what we think the public will like to hear us do. And we uh, base our judgment on experience of years before visible audiences who have watched as well as listened to our rendition of music. And uh, once we have uh, discovered what we feel is a good formula for ourselves, we try to follow it out. And we don't think, in fact, I believe the opposite, we don't think that any audience likes the same music of different artists. In other words, what they would like of us, they might not like of Paul Whiteman or Rudy Vallee or other bands in our field, and uh, uh, I should uh, call attention to the fact that I'm not doing very well, that I didn't prepare an address. I'm uh, talking from notes and from having listened. I think you're fine. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll be after the real drumstick now, after this is all over. That was Billy Phelps, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, first of all, Dr. Frank Black mentioned the musical sophisticate and uh, the musical snob. Uh, those people are strangers to me. Of course, I, I know very little about about the uh, sophisticated music. I mean, I see a green light. Does that mean go ahead? 
Mr. You Green? have just one minute. I have one minute. Well, I can't say very much, so I won't even go into that, except that the social sophisticate seems to like the very low-type music. Now, uh, we have found... We have... <laughs> Uh, we have found that uh, uh, um, a generous mixture of comedy and speed and contrast is uh, is the best way to build up our particular type program. And we do know that they want a certain amount of swing, they want a certain amount of singing, they want college songs which come under the, the more, uh, uh, well, the earlier form of swing music because, of course, you all know that swing music really is only something which has a very predominant rhythm which makes you react physically. It makes you either tap your feet or want to dance. And the earliest of the swing music, of course, was the tom-tom, and later the marches, and here it is back. They changed the name again, and the red light is on. Uh, but I will, I will insist on saying that uh, uh, of our music, of the work we do, the people do seem to like the ensemble singing. That is, the men's voices, the blending of men's voices, which, in my opinion... Uh, done by anyone is the, the probably the best liked and easiest to listen to music. And that, thank you very much, then, <laughs> both of you. Uh, uh, we, our, our music varies, for instance, if we sing Sibelius Finlandia, if we sing it in our own way with a very sweet and understandable uh, blending of our voices and a nice interpretation, they like that just as well as though we would sing any of Stephen Foster's music or Gershwin or Kern. And uh, that's about all I can say, but I would love to have some discussion on this. Thank you very much. Next thing I'm going to say to you sounds like a horrible lie, but honestly, it's the literal truth. Use your imagination. Uh, just the imagination is... My imagination has always worked over time. <laughs> but this is no imagination. I just said that the speaker who just addressed you so beautifully is the great-grandson of the founder of Penn State College. But Olga Samarov, whom I'm going to introduce now, is not only the great-granddaughter of a Yale graduate, but when she got her degree of the Doctor of Music from Pennsylvania, she got it exactly 100 years to a day from the time her great-grandfather graduated from Yale and not only that, but she's a lineal descendant of Abraham Pearson, the first president of Yale in 1701. Now, with all these great-grandsons and great-granddaughters around here, I'm beginning to feel young again. No, I, uh, I was not present at that. <laughs> Only in imagination. Like the turkey. I carved the turkey myself tonight, so I got just what I wanted. But when I was the youngest of a large family, and I always got the back of the neck. It's taken me a good many years to get it up. Now then, the first time August Amaroff appeared at Yale, I got her there. There was a tremendous snow blizzard. Terrific. Three feet deep, and Woolsey Hall, holding 3,000 people, was jammed to the doors while she played the sonatas at Beethoven. But she can talk and she can play. In fact, I never found anything that Alger couldn't do. Come on, Alger, and tell us how you do it. I'm always terribly afraid of Billy Phelps' introductions, and I don't think it's fair for him to sit in his own library and say things like that about me. I'm going to be very rapid, because I know this light's going to go on so I'm half through. And I believe very firmly, I'll have to take, uh, I'll have to contradict the, uh, speaker went before me only in one point. I don't believe your education necessarily has to begin in the cradle, because I've had too many thousand layman students up to the age of 81 in the last few years. But I do not believe we'll ever know what the public really wants until more people think clearly about what music can mean in the individual life. So I'm going to forget about types of music and the radio for a minute and just talk about what music can be in your life. It can be either composing or performance or listening. Now, of course, we hear a tremendous lot about music as an outlet for the emotions in performance. That reminds me of a story Jean-Jacques Rousseau alludes to in his famous letter on French music. The story is that a child was supposed to be born with a golden tooth. And all the doctors got excited and discussed 
this phenomenon and how it could happen and so forth. Until finally, somebody with a little more intelligence decided to verify whether the tooth was made of gold, and it wasn't. Now, I think that if we examine our musical education of the past, we'll find that it was not all that it was supposed to be. It is like that golden tooth. I think tying an unwilling child to a piano and forcing it to play and to make anybody think that they cannot be musical without some type of performance is all wrong. If you regard it merely as an outlet for the emotions, let us stop and think what we would think of letting a, a child that had excess energy spend it in throwing brickbats at paintings and sculptures. Of course, the damage to the paintings and sculptures would be permanent, and the musical masterpieces, thank God, can survive even the worst performance. <laughs> but let us stop for a minute and see whether the taste of the performer and his attitude towards music and his possibilities in music survive that kind of performance. Let us take a, a case where Frederick the Great, who is held up to us all as, as one of the great amateurs of history. He played the flute, according to Frank contemporaries, very badly. Now let us see what happened in his life. He had concerts every day, except on Mondays and Fridays, which were opera nights. Uh, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, son of the great John Sebastian, had to accompany him and hated it. Hated it so much and was so frank in his criticisms that uh, Frederick the Great never liked him. Well, now what happened when Frederick the Great lost his teeth and could no longer play the flute? <laughs> Music dwindled at his court to a point which proved that his own flute playing was the only thing he was enthusiastic about. Harry Bauer once said, it is more important for men to be able to speak or write to each other than for Shakespeare to have lived. We'll grant that is true. But luckily, we do not have to choose between reading and writing and having Shakespeare. And we do not have to choose in music between performance and listening. We can do both. If we have any urge to perform, let us perform. If we perform very badly, I personally don't want to listen to it, but that's just a personal thing. If anybody wants an outlet for the emotions and loves to take a Beethoven sonata and ruin it, in order to have that outlet, let them do it. But my great point is that the intake of music in everybody's life, and I don't care how well you play or how well you sing or how well you do anything, the greatest thing in your life is really the experience you get from music, whether you produce the sound yourself or somebody else produces it. And in order to have that experience, you've got to be an active listener. And in order to be an active listener, you've got to develop yourself. Because after all, my dear friends, Beethoven had to develop himself, and Paderewski had to develop himself. Every performer and every composer who ever lived, why should the layman say, I don't have to do anything? And why should we ever say that we don't need to understand music? We hear when the, con when the sound reaches our consciousness. We don't hear without that consciousness. And the way our consciousness functions is what is going to make us have some idea of what we want in music. And only then will we be able to know it. If you only have certain types of musical experience, you can't possibly know about the others. In a book that I wrote called The Lamest Music Book, I think I made a point in, point in saying how enormously personal listening is. Someone else can compose music for you. Someone else can perform music for you. No one on earth can listen to music for you. Music is like nature. Nature has wildflowers. Music has folk music. Nature has gay moods. We have popular music. Nature has grandeur. We have great music. Nature has weeds, and we have bad music of every type. Why be limited to want any one variety of music ex exclusively? Why not train yourself to listen actively and be able to detect the best in all types? It seems to me that's what we want. We pause briefly for station identification. Now, uh, your moderator may interrupt you for just a moment. We will pause just a moment for station identification. Professor Salt, the meeting is now on your hand. I'm glad at that moment of silent prayer that I can go on. <laughs> now I want to say right this to every person visible and invisible. I am awfully sorry for most of you. Awfully sorry. Because most of you were born after 1880. And if you were, you missed the greatest ten years that the world has ever seen in the Metropolitan Opera House 
and in the operas of the world. The collection of singing birds, right there in the Metropolitan Opera House in New York from 1890 to 1900, I don't need to name them, but they were the greatest the world ever saw. I was younger then. I used to go down here and take the midnight train back to New Haven, get there at half past two, get up at seven o'clock and teach my courses. And, you know, one day I felt a little seedy in the morning and I said to an undergraduate, I said, is there anything worse than taking that midnight train to New Haven? Yes, he said, there's one thing worse and that's missing it. No, I've, uh, I could talk about that opera all the rest of the night, but wouldn't these people murder me on the stage if I did? The next speaker is Mr. Sturson, who is a great conductor, and he's going to say something that while I like him, I probably shall not agree with what he says, but I believe that the truth should be heard. Come on. Professor Phelps, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin by saying that I was born in 1894. I'm very grateful, though, that I've had a chance to live in the days of Lawrence Tibbet, John Charles Thomas, Rosa Poncel, Charles Pullman, Helen Jepson, and Gladys Swarthout, to name a few of our present stars in the Metropolitan. Uh, one of the most arresting phenomena in the American musical scene is the newly awakened interest in opera. A significant sign of the times is to be observed just around the corner at the New York Hippodrome, which is filled one part of the week with enthusiasts of that fine old American sport, boxing, and the rest of the week with grand opera fans. Our symphony orchestras and music festivals are introducing stage performances of opera to their subscribing audience. The Metropolitan Opera Association has found it profitable to present the spring season at popular prices. It is not necessary to go into all the causes behind this rebirth of opera enthusiasm, but I find a clue in accounting for this new interest in a description of operatic conditions in the time of Monteverdi some 300 years ago. Until the year 1637, opera had been a spectacle for princes alone. The popular feeling then was that opera was a dying form of musical art. The action of, a, of an astute group of Venetians changed all of this when they opened the first public opera house in Venice in 1637, thereby giving opera a new lease of life. A problem which is somewhat peculiar only to opera patrons in this country is the question of whether opera should be given with the text in the original language. It might interest you to know that other countries at various times were called upon to cross this bridge. A musical history tells us of the controversy that raged in the time of Mozart as to whether music could be sung in any other tongue than Italian. Mozart settled it by composing the magic flute in German, thereby paving the way for the glorious German operas that were to follow. In London, Handel was having indifferent success with his 53 Italian operas until Gay and his Beggar's Opera gave him the idea of using an English text for his oratorio. With these works, Handel not only restored his fortune but carved for himself a place among the musical immortals. The present custom in Europe is to present opera in the language of the audience. I have heard Tristan in French in Paris and Carmen in German in Berlin. European audiences assert their right to understand the meaning of the word and plot, as well as the music. At our Metropolitan Opera, tradition has upheld the performance of opera with the text in the language of the librettist. This custom is a heritage of the time when the only operatic artists in this country were foreigners. Of course, there have been occasional departures from this practice, such as the time when Shalyapin sang Boris in Russian, while the rest of the cast sang in Italian. And uh, only last year, Madame Vettergren gave us an excellent performance of Carmen in Swedish. Uh, today, the Metropolitan Opera has among its stars a large proportion of American artists, and I see no reason why our opera doors shouldn't follow the European custom of demanding that the majority of operas be given in the language of the audience. And, although it might be difficult for us New Yorkers to believe it, that language is English. 
Excuse me, I'm sorry to break in on you, Mr. Cecil, but... Yes, Mr. Hirschman. Uh, granting that the American language is as beautiful as it is, isn't the standard of the performance of music, uh, for example, at the Metropolitan, more important than the language of the text? And will it not live or die on that basis? And would you advocate that all operas be given in English? Mr. Hirschman, I would not be dogmatic upon this point, but I feel that a start should be made with the operas based on definitely English subjects, such as Verdi's Othello and Falstaff, based on the plays by Shakespeare, Puccini's Madame Butterfly and The Girl of the Golden West, based on plays by John Luther Long and David Belasco. Who has not felt amused and annoyed when the cowboys of the latter opera, called Ragazzi, at the Metropolitan, step up to the bar and in true Western fashion shout, Whiskey per tutti. Uh, comedy operas like The Barber of Seville and Mozart's Figaro certainly fail to get over when the audience does not comprehend the jokes. It might be said that the audience wouldn't understand the words even if they were sung in English. This is merely a question of good enunciation and skillfully translated text. In the spring season of the Metropolitan, every word of the excellent English version of The Bartered Bride came over the footlights. In fact, this performance was so successful that it will be given in the main season this year. I am happy to state that the Metropolitan will also produce Chimarosa's clandestine marriage based on Garrick's play in English this winter. English can be understood when sung. The radio has been a good school for our singers, and the Doyle, Cart, Gilbert, and Sullivan troupe is glorious example. Of course, there is some prejudice against using even excellent translations, although people listen unprotestingly to translated versions of the plays of Chekhov, Rustam, and Ibsen, and to say nothing of the King James version of the Bible. I am willing to concede that for the time being it is better to present operas having libretti of definite literary values such as the Wagnerian music dramas in the original language, but unfortunately few libretti have literary value. As a lover of the beautiful sound of the English language and believing that opera can only take deep root in the lives of the people when intelligibly and intelligently presented, I rest my case for opera in English. Thank you, Mr. Cecil. I'm delighted to hear so able a presentation. But, and I mustn't take up time, but I'll simply remind you that I heard Jean de Resca and Emma Ames and the greatest singers in the world sing Wagner in Italian, and they were not satisfied. And when I heard them sing the same operas in German, when they were written in German, the, uh, it was marvelous, the difference. There's no doubt about it. Then you must remember that just what you said, the librettos of most operas are silly. Wagner's the only man who wrote great librettos. Don Giovanni's one of the greatest operas ever written, but the libretto is silly. Fortunately, we don't have to hear it in English. It would be terrible if you could hear it in English. But there's something even worse than that. Most of the great singers, most of them, are foreigners. Now, English is the most difficult language in the world to pronounce. Most difficult. And I would a great deal rather hear Lowen couldn't say, Elsa, ich liebe dich. They hear him say, Elsa, ich love you. <laughs> Professor Phelps, we could go on with this discussion for a long time, and I'm sure that there are a great many uh, questions that you people here in your living room would uh, like to settle among yourselves, but I think we should let some of this audience, let the audience in on some of this discussion. I see a number of distinguished musicians and uh, music lovers in the audience. And now we'll take the questions. Please rise, state, your na state the name of the person to whom your question is directed, and limit your questions to 25 words. Questions, please. Yes, sir, right here. I have a question for Dr. Frank Black. Dr. Black. Yes, sir. Why can't the National Broadcasting Company and other radio organizations increase good music and cut down on advertising. Why can't the radio center provide just one program of good classical music at all times, every day? 
Well, now, Dr. Black is the musical director of the NBC. He ought to be able to answer that question. Uh, you mean that there should be a continuous program of classic music? I mean, Dr. Black, that amongst all the stations that are broadcasting, there should be at least one on the air at all times presenting good music. It's true that the ideal radio program all over the country would be a different program on every station at all times, so that no matter where you were, you could listen to it. But if you didn't happen to have a set that could get Frisco when they had a good program on, you would be out of luck. Thank you, sir. Other question? And the balcony. Any questions from here? Yes? Balcony? You want to ask Dr. Black a question, too? I'd like to know. Yes? Dr. Black. Yes? I'd like to know if there's a place on radio, in radio, much of a place, modern American music being written today, not jazz. Ruby Bloom, Pretty Girl Faye, even Cyril Scott. Yes, yes there's plenty of, plenty of uh, room for that type of thing. As a matter of fact, we have done a great deal. I personally have directed a great deal of it on the air myself in the last five years. Last Sunday, uh, a week ago last Sunday, I gave a performance, an hour's performance, with three new works. One by Girl Faye, one by Hans Spielek, and one by Russell Bennett. Very serious work, but not symphony. Thank you, Dr. Black. Now, here's a question that came in by telegraph from Chicago, from the uh, Albany Park Music Class of the AEP, Adult Education Project. Uh, it's addressed to Madam Samara. Uh, has there been any increase shown in the interest of music since the adult education music classes have been functioning? Well, I think that uh, one thing is very significant. The Layman's Music Courses collaborated with uh, Dr. Sokolov and the WPA last year, and one of our people went down to Florida and stayed there for several weeks, I think six weeks or eight weeks. I was in Europe. I'm not quite sure of the length of time. One net result of that uh, undertaking was that the legislation in uh, Florida put back music into public schools. Uh, Professor Phelps, here's a question for you. But folks, what is your understanding of jazz? Isn't jazz just a lot of noise? <laughs> well, you know, I'd like to pass that uh, question along, but I'll tell you the most terrific definition of jazz I ever heard. Percy Granger, who I think is the greatest genius of any kind that ever came out of Australia, I heard him say... <laughs> yes, and I know uh, Jack Crawford, too. But... Um, I heard him say that all Beethoven did was to jazz Bach. And what do you suppose he took as an illustration? He took the Falkstein Sonata, my favorite sonata of Beethoven's, and said that lovely melody in the first movement was nothing but jazzing of Bach. Now, if that is jazz, then I'm going to pass the question to somebody else. Mr. Waring, how would you like to have a crack at that question? What do you say about jazz? Uh, frankly, I don't know what jazz is, and I doubt if any modern musician today knows exactly what jazz is. Uh, our feeling is that the people think that jazz is music, and we don't know that uh, jazz is music. We feel that jazz is merely a word used to, to express the feeling or, or, or the emotions of the people who play the, the uh, Latin type or the rhythmic form or the variation on the theme. I think you people feel that jazz is a conglomeration of notes where no one is playing the melody. Uh, uh oh. Uh, I see uh, Mr. Pietro Young, the organist of St. Patrick's Cathedral, up there with a question. Yes, sir. What is it, Mr. Young? I have a question for Mr. Black. A question for Mr. Black? <laughs> many radio stations, I have been told that classic organ music is not wanted by the general public. Yet, in all my concerts from coast to coast, capacity audiences have shown more enthusiasm for classic than any other kind of organ music. <coughs> I would like to know... Yes, why not have classic organ music on the radio? Music, or, uh, or the radio. Yes. 
No, I think I think that you're right in that. I think there should be more classic music on classic organ music on the air. There's a great deal of unexplored organ music which has not been done over the radio. I'll tell you why. Every town that has a radio station thinks that their own organist in their own town is the best organist in the country. <laughs> when we want to broadcast over our chain of fine artists, we may have the people in that town say, well, we have an organist here uh, who is a good organist, and we have a good organ, and why not do it ourselves? Well, they're not equipped to do it. They're not acquainted, most of them, with the finest in organ music, but that's what we're told. Uh, Mr. Hirschman, here's a question that's been handed up. I'm afraid it's uh, phrased in rather insulting form, but I'll read it just as it's phrased. What can be done to keep the audience awake during chamber music? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> uh, I, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm only a, a businessman. Uh, the trouble with the, the, the bad start the chamber music got was, I think, uh, based on the name. Uh, a lot of people think if they listen to uh, chamber music in a chamber, it's something to put them to sleep. Now, uh, uh, I would suggest to this person that he come to the next concert of the New Friends of Music, and it'll keep him awake plenty. <laughs> uh, Mr. Waring. Uh, isn't the radio killing a lot of good music by overplaying the better-known selections? Well, by the better-known selections, I, I presume you mean the better-known popular selections, and I do agree that overplaying of these uh, songs does kill them. And that uh, is uh, proven by the fact that sheet music, which is the, the uh, only means the publisher has of knowing how well the people like his music, uh, the sale of sheet music today is, is less than one-tenth of the sale of sheet music before radio. I hope that answers the question. Uh, any other questions in the balcony? No? Yes? Young lady, right up there. Uh, Madam Sakata. Louder, please. For Grand Opera on the, uh, or in the movie. What's that? Uh, Mary Garden. I think the person was Mr. Delvin Did you want to know what about more grand opera in the movie? Yes, yeah, what are the potentialities for grand opera in the movie? Well, I don't think anybody knows yet what the potentialities are, but personally I think they're very great. I don't see any reason why, if the, if the sound films improve acoustically, why grand opera couldn't be given in a very marvelous way, and I think it's going to be, probably in English. <laughs> Mr. Cecil, do you advocate giving all operas in English? I believe I answered that question before. You you do, or you don't? <laughs> well, I thought I made clear in my talk that I didn't intend to be dogmatic on that point, but that I advocated uh, a certain type of opera. The but, comedy opera, the opera based particularly on English subjects, and uh, operas having a very definite plot that might interest the audience. Well, here's a very interesting question that's just been handed in. Somebody wants to know why we can't have another song by Miss Pauline Pierce. <laughs> Miss Pierce, I see on the list of things that you might sing tonight, the flower song from Faust in English. Would you do that for us? Very good. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Metropolitan have such a thing as that. I want to say that the Metropolitan Opera House today is, as it has been for 50 years, the greatest opera house in any country in the world. The only reason they don't have the singers uh, that they had 10 years ago, uh, in, <laughs> in 1890 to 1900, is because such singers don't exist today. Nowhere in the world. But you can be sure of one thing. New York is the musical capital of the whole world today. And the best singing you'll hear of any opera in the world, you'll hear in the Metropolitan Opera House today. And if you're not able to go there, you can hear it over the radio. Thank God. Thank you, Professor Phelps. And thank all members of this, of your uh, guests in your uh, imaginary living room who enjoyed your imaginary dinner. And uh, thank you all members of the audience well, I hope you had a very real and not an imaginary dinner. And now we're going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Lois Havrilla for the announcement for next week. Mr. Havrilla. Thank you. And now as we bring our discussion to a close, we'd like to know if you would like to have a copy of tonight's broadcast, complete with questions and answers. And if you would, send your request together with 10 cents in stamps or coin to the League for Political Education. 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. May I repeat that address for you? The League for Political Education, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Now, the next week, we return to the field of political education when we will have as our guest speakers the Assistant Secretary of State, the Honorable Francis Beausair, and the Honorable Warren R. Austin, United States Senator from the state of Vermont, who will discuss the subject, Will Reciprocal Tariffs Promote American Recovery? Will Reciprocal Tariffs Promote American Recovery? I'll meet next week. Reciprocal Tariffs and American Recovery. I'll meet next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>